Welcome, everybody, and a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. This session will be about scaling up best practices in the context of adaptation to climate change. We're going to be sharing with you practices that work in the field and which can be upscaled in the areas of climate smart agriculture, agroecology, and watershed development. We have a group of very outstanding and distinguished panelists who cover a wide range of backgrounds, experience, and expertise. And they will be talking about how they've applied best practices, how they've evolved them, applied them, and grown them to scale in the area of implementation of projects, in the area of generating knowledge and applying it across systems, actions, and communities at various levels, and in the area of policy and institutional development. So it's an eclectic mix of both backgrounds in terms of expertise and competencies and experience, as well as in the variety of topics and areas that they've engaged it over decades. We have seven speakers. And uh, the, first, uh, se the first set of speakers will be, will be led by Dr. Pablo Suarez, who is standing for the director, standing in place of the director, Red Cross and Red Crescent's Climate Center. Dr. Suarez, the floor is now yours, and I would request you to give a very brief introduction of yourself. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity. Is this uh, on? Now it should be on. Good. Uh, hi, my name is Pablo Suarez. I work with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. It's like a think tank within the largest humanitarian organization in this planet, and we address the humanitarian consequences of both climate change, and extreme weather events. Uh, my role is Associate Director for Research and Innovation. So it is my task to notice what's going on that can be useful and to bring in the new things so that our colleagues, our volunteers, our disaster managers, our food security directors can make things better for people at risk. I am going to talk today for less than 10 minutes about how to link early warning with early action. We know that in a changing climate, more of the things we don't like are likely to happen. Extreme events, floods, droughts, heat waves, you name it. There are also the slow onsets, but for now allow me to focus on the things that happen with a little bit more speed and that have consequences that can be avoided it is important to remember the distinction between a disaster, which implies suffering, loss, and an extreme event, which is a natural phenomenon that may lead to a disaster if we are not prepared. How to link knowledge about a likely extreme event, such as a forecast of too much rain over there, the river is going to bring the water here, and we may all get flooded. How can we take action early action based on an early warning. In our team and throughout the humanitarian sector, it has been typical that we have two ways of funding our work. Most of the money that deals with disasters we get after the shock has already happened. When CNN is showing that there's people about to die, because of hunger, because of lack of shelter, because of health conditions, then it's easier for us to say, oh my goodness, someone's in trouble. We need to go from here to there to do certain good things. And to do that, we need money for the fuel, we need money for the tents, we need a salary for the truck driver and so on. And so money comes to deal with emergencies, emergency appeals, disaster relief emergency funds and so on. The money comes when the need is already there. And usually it's very important to act fast, which means expensive. You cannot get 75 trucks in northern Burkina Faso like that. Uh, and also, chances are that they're not the best conditions. If it's flooded, getting there is likely going to be in a place where the bridges may have been washed away by the flood, the roads are impassable and so on. So one source of funding, wait for the shock, then go do the thing. Another source of funding is for a normal day. You have chronic uh, I don't know, HIV AIDS, then you need to do 
measures every day to help people not suffer. You may have to do trainings. You may need to change the tires of the vehicle. Those are things that come through every year. Some money comes into the Botswana Red Cross, the Bangladeshi Red Crescent, and so on. Now, there's a blatant gap in between. What do we do when science says, watch out, there is a gigantic dark cloud over there. It's very likely to rain like hell. And if it does, all these people are likely to go underwater unless you do something to prepare them. And we're like, OK, sounds like it, if your science is good, which is getting better and better, let's do something. Um, OK, who pays for the fuel for the driver? Should I take money that was going to be used for training and instead of training, reallocate and do something that maybe seems wasteful because the forecast doesn't materialize? That would be wrong. That would be violation of the agreement with the donor. Should I take money that was allocated to feed the hungry from last year's drought? That would be unacceptable. There is, or there has until recently, been no source of funding for before the disaster, after science says the disaster is likely. And when we talk about river basins, watersheds, which is one of the themes in this session, that is really not smart because we have between days and weeks in advance between science saying, watch out, something bad may happen, and the ability to help people in harm's way. And it's much cheaper, much better, much faster, much more reliable to take action before disaster after forecast. But we need money. The issue is that the money may be much less than you would need after the fact. My favorite example, in Malawi, they have their grain surrounded by bamboo canes after the harvest so the goats won't eat it. Well, if a flood comes, their harvest is destroyed. We need to go through roads that are in bad shape to deliver bags with food to people who are desperate. That's expensive. Before it flooded, someone knew that there was a lot of water coming. If we had a little bit of money to send a pickup truck, not a giant truck, with empty bags, not bags full of grain, arrive to the community and say, hello, uh, we heard that it's raining like hell or that it may be raining very intensely. And so just in case, here are some empty bags for you. If you want, you can put your own grind in the bag, the bag up a tree, and if the flood comes, you don't need food aid. How much would that cost compared to food aid? Maybe 10 times less, which means that you could act based on forecast eight times, get it wrong, because the cloud went to the other side of the mountain, and still once get it right and you got savings and you got better humanitarian results. This very simple idea, which we are calling forecast-based financing, financing based on a forecast, it's simple. It hasn't been happening before, in part because it requires articulation between many different actors. Someone with the science, it can be the National Meteorological Service, it can be a hydro service, it can be a global satellite-based bunch of experts, Someone says what may happen, there's usually some kind of authority that can give the green light to take action or not. There's usually someone who knows what to do, like the Red Cross or many other community uh, organizations that can reach a community. You need to know what to do, you need to have the assets, you need the experts. Putting that together has not been easy, but once we cracked it, and it would take more time than I have to explain what we did, but we put together a system. Define what is a level that is too dangerous of water, of uh, in the river, or extreme temperatures for heat waves, many other physical parameters, coastal storms, you name it, cold snaps in Peru for alpacas. And once you know what is too much of something bad, natural phenomenon, then you measure the probability of that happening. On a normal day, maybe less than 1%, not worth taking action. But if something strange is happening, either within five days because of immediate rainfall or within three months because of El Nino, then you may reach a level of probability that says, you know what, the risk is now too high. 
let's take action just in case. And if we get it right, we accomplish better results with less money. We have to accept, but maybe it doesn't materialize, but we should choose our, our uh, parameters so that in the long run, across time and space, it works. Why did we choose to share this one about scaling up? The idea needs to be good and needs to be in principle applicable with the right tweaks and adaptation to many other places. One of the problems we confront is that very often what is really good in this community will not work on the community on this other side of the river because of nature, because of physics, because of culture, because of faith or a number of other things. But when it comes to inter-institutional articulation of stakeholders and players, we found that it really makes a difference to start with dialogues that enable the emergence of trust to set up what we call dialogue platforms where the donor, the government authority, the scientific expert, the humanitarian worker, the community representative come together and examine what is going on, what will happen next time there's too much rain or too much temperature and, uh, and see how we can do things differently. For scaling up, for taking things to new places, it is crucial to understand that it's not only about the conventional metrics of success, it is also about interpersonal and interinstitutional relationships. And it takes time to mature those connections. We're very grateful to World Vision and the many other partners on this table and beyond who have been part of this continued dialogue processes where we have to reflect what are we trying to accomplish given that the risks are, are changing so rapidly and we know we will not have more, we will not be able to double our budgets and just do more response. It simply will not work. We have to rethink the way we work. For that reason, as a challenge to us in the thinking and the acting bridge, scaling up will happen if we combine conversations that first build trust and then build knowledge and based on that build action as opposed to showing up and saying you do this because it's better or because i tell you so because i'm your donor or your government then make sure that you document with the metrics that matter to your peers how things can work in our experience forecast based financing and i'm wrapping up with this has now been picked up by uh, German donors, Dutch donors, the White House has issued a press release saying that they want it. But more importantly, communities are beginning to want it. In Togo, just a month and a half ago, a hydropower dam was filling up. Because of our system, it became clear that downstream we could take action before the overspill. And things started to happen even without money, because some things can be done. So we can do more, let's do more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. I realized I had, did not introduce myself to you. I'm Crispino Lobo from the Watershed Organization Trust. I'm its managing trustee and also its co-founder. Water is working in the area of climate change adaptation across various sectors. And if you want to know more about the kind of work we do, please visit us at www.wotr.org. I would now like to invite the World Vision to share its experiences in practice as well as policy mediation in regard to farmer-managed natural regeneration in Ethiopia and Kenya. It's a 15-minute session, and the first part will be a video for three minutes, followed by a presentation by Asefa Tofu, who is the program manager, Ethiopia Drylands uh, Project, on behalf of the World Vision, and by Lawrence Kigoru, who is uh, the World Vision representative based out of Kenya. I would like to know, could you please uh, show the, the video, please? Open it under this thing. Okay. Okay, so then maybe I invite uh, Asefa. A brief introduction to Asefa. Uh, Sefa Tofu is based out of Addis Ababa. At one time before, he was a director of the Awasa Research Center, 
and since 2005 has been working for World Vision. His achievement is the Humbo Ethiopia Clean Development Mechanism, which is registered by the UNFCC in 2009, and which is the first and only CDM project in Ethiopia and the largest in Africa. His background, he has a master's in agriculture from the Haryana University, India, and is currently doing a PhD in distance learning from the University of South Africa. Asefa, over to you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, and uh, I'll be very brief. Yeah, uh, my, my topic is mainly on farmer managed natural regeneration in Ethiopia, and uh, this is to talk mainly on forestry. Uh, it is a relationship with the climate adaptation as well as resilience. So I think as many of you know that what is, why forestry is important, maybe uh, in Bonn in 2011, the global community decided to establish like 150 million hectares of land for forestry in 2020. And that has been improved by a New York declaration to 350 million hectares by 2030. That is a global target, and why this is happening? Uh, number one, it is uh, forestry is capturing or storing the CO2, as well as also the day-to-day -day, uh, community as well as the public use. So uh, coming to Africa, 65% of arable land and 30% of grazing land has already been lost because of many reasons. And uh, as at the moment, more than 700 million hectares of land has potential for uh, restoration. And coming to my country, Ethiopia, uh, one fourth of the land is degraded, and uh, which is affecting about 20 million of the population. And uh, with this background about the forestry, okay, what what is farmer managed natural regeneration in terms of forestry? So the brief definition: farmer managed natural regeneration is the protection and the management of shoots growing from the existing leaving tree stumps, roots, and the tree seeds, especially useful tree species. Like, if I take uh, one example from Ethiopia, like, uh, as a country, Ethiopia has been planting uh, four to six billion seedlings annually for the last seven years, which has been impact contributed to increase the tree coverage from 2.7% to 15% across the last two decades. But it's still the challenge, uh, one of the challenges in Ethiopia and the many parts of the world is that the seedling survival is a challenge. Meaning you can, one can plant billions of seedlings, but the survival, according to the Ethiopia expert estimate, is below 50%. That means if we consider like one tree seedling cost 0.5 dollar, so the, if the survival is 50%, uh, Meaning that the unsurvived, the, the days of the seedling can go, can bring up to 1.5 billion USD lost annually for the country. It is not only for Ethiopia, I think this is true for many parts of Africa and Asia, because in many parts of the world, particularly the intertropical, the, the tree survival is below 50%. While forestry is the key to stabilizing climate change and improving rural community livelihood. And in specific to farmer, I mean FMNR is farmer managed natural regeneration and Ethiopia. As part of the country climate resilient green economy, uh, CRG, PAS intend to reduce the net greenhouse gas emission by 64% in 2030 um, as Ethiopia as a country committed. So as a, Ethiopia as a country committed to restore 15 million of degraded land by 2030, which is uh, restoring in, in, into the forest. So this means what this means. This restoring 15 million hectares in Ethiopia could capture as much as 1.42 gigaton CO2 equivalent. That means rem that, is that this this means also equivalent to removing almost 300 million cars from the roads only for one year globally. So you can imagine what is the significance of afforestation reforestation and improving the forest coverage. Uh, because of that reason, because of the forestry, the seedling survival and the forestry cost reason, uh, World Vision introduced uh, a practice called farmer managed natural regeneration from West Africa, Niger in, in 2005. And uh, this, this, this area used to be uh, 
degraded, but gradually this has been improved in 2010. So if you come to 2014, you can see how this, because of the FMNR, these, these uh, foggy areas or, or degraded areas are improved within four years with the number of biodiversity and a lot of change within the ecosystem. So what is variable manage, natural regeneration? It is, there are different process that I don't want to go to the detail. They're selecting from eligible land up to uh, regular, regulatory mechanism. These are some of the process. And uh, with the help of farmer managed natural generation, particularly in project called Humbo, uh, Humbo uh, Afforestation Reforestation CDM, we saved around $1.4 million from plantation and mainly using the FFN, FMNR. Because of that reason, that money has been put to another project. So this is a big amount of money within less than 3,000 hectares. So what's happening at this moment, we are trying in Ethiopia to standard, standardize what, how FMNR, like one sing, single stamp, two stamp, three stamp, and the control. Which one is optimum, so for which one people have to go. So in case of the, the same project in Humbo, in the same project in Humbo has been brought a lot of um, things. The good thing on FMNR is the low cost replicability, innovation, and linking community with the low, uh, global community uh, mitigation and the bringing carbon finance to the community. It's not only that, also bringing the water. This is in, in, in the Sodo, particular near to the Humbo area. The dried spring, which has been dried 50 years ago, they come back and they start now uh, find, uh, helping the community, bringing the, the water to the community. The results are dramatically inferior, dramatically reduced tree plantation cost, removed tree survival change, uh, brought back biodiversity, improved water percolation, and the sequester this amount of fig, uh, this figure of the CO2, and uh, rehabilitated ecosystem. And the consideration when someone is thinking of FMNR is attitude. There is a professional as well as also farmer attitude attitude in terms of uh, FMNR, selecting eligible, eligible area not pruning or ignoring to prune that particular area, nursery sy syndrome and FMNR versus open grazing. So well vision and FMNR, that's uh, in Ethiopia, it, the world vision has been uh, uh, promoting this one across 100 uh, districts. And uh, beyond that, well vision has been promoting than 38 countries in, in, in the world, in, in Africa, Asia, even in, in Latin America and uh, some eastern part of the Europe. So thank you so much. Finally, I want to say that it will be, uh, uh, my friend will be presenting one thing, but on 9th of November, there will be another more information we'll be presenting uh, 19th of um, uh, November on two, at 2 p.m. in uh, Blue Zone. So more information, you can get more information on, by, by that day. Otherwise, thank you so much for the attention. So, my friend, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Lawrence Kiguru is the Associate Director, Livelihoods and Resilience, World Vision, based out of Kenya. He was, he's, a, he's had a stint in academia as well as in government service. By way of education, he has a master's in agriculture economics from McGill University, Canada, and currently is pursuing his PhD in development studies at Jomo Kenyatta University, Nairobi. I would like to invite you, Lawrence, to speak in three minutes. We would, be, we would appreciate if you can wrap up your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. My focus, my, my colleague focused mainly on, mit, on kind of mitigation to climate change, but me, I'll be focusing more on adaptation to climate change, specifically with a focus on rainwater harvesting for use on the farm. Mainly when you talk about what people think about uh, People think in terms of uh, uh, water tanks and roof catchments, but here I'm talking about water harvesting for use by crops. And I'm going to focus on four specific technologies that we have had an experience in, in Kenya, one of which is the use, use of subsoilers, the other one is the use of zypids, the other one the use of sunken beds, and the other one is the use of on-farm water, pod, uh, water pods, or what we call backcards, or some people call them silangas in our language in, in Kenya, that is Swahili. Now, a subsoil is simply a simple tool that's normally attached to the, to the, to the oxen plow. The aim being to break the, the hard pan and therefore allow water to, to go deeper into the soil. Experience has shown that in places where people use oxen plow, 
The plow normally goes all the way up to a depth of about one foot or so uh, under the soil. And continuous use of that plow creates a hard pan. And unless that, that hard pan is broken, water normally, uh, be, uh, when it rains, water just, just froze, uh, froze like, uh, froze a, a, a run of water. So to, to, to prevent that, you break that hard pan so that water can be able to infiltrate into the soil and be, be stored under the soil for crop use. A farm has shown us, has, has, has given us a challenge of comparing maize that is grown using soil that is that's absorbed and water that and soil that is not absorbed and the difference is normally very uh, animals. And a farmer told us if you can be able to, to put the maize that is planted on some soil that some soil that he's going to, to give us money out of that, but we could not approach that maize because the roots will normally go very deep into the soil. And that's normally an example of a crop growing uh, in subsoil lot. The, the crop in the middle is where the, 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 the subsoil has really gone deep in the soil. The, the one on the edges is where the, where the subsoil is not very deep as, the, as, the, as the, uh, maybe the, 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 the oxen animals are turning around. And you can see the difference in the performance. We have done that and we, see, we think the results can be, uh, can, be, can be huge. The other one is the use of zypids. Again, these are, these are simply pits or holes that are about two feet by two feet, two feet, two feet wide, two feet, two, two, two feet, two feet length and two, two feet deep. And then you, you normally remove the, the topsoil, put it aside, and then the subsoil, put it on the other side, put a lot of manure on the topsoil, and then on the subsoil, the, the second layer of, of, of one foot, put a lot of trash, farm trash. Then put back the soil together with, with, with the manure back into the pit. When it rains, the, the, the area with a lot of trash stores water when it rains. And therefore, when, when there's no water or when there's no rain, that water becomes useful for crop use, which is on the other top layer of the soil. Again, we have had that, done this, or we have seen that, that with an average of about, uh, okay, a farmer can have an average of four, k, 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 four kilograms of grain from one zypit. And therefore, we tell a farmer to make an average of five, 500 zypits. And therefore, with that, farmer can be able to harvest up to an average of one metric ton of grain, which is about enough for use, for, for use at the farm level. The other one is the use of sand candy beds. The principle is basically the same, but instead of having pits, you just have a trench. You can make it as long as you want, which is normally good for, for, for kitchen gardening. And, why, and as long as it's not more than one meter wide. Why it should not be more than a meter wide is that you should not step inside, you should work from the sides to make sure that you don't compact the soil, uh, you know, that has already been loosened. The, 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 the topsoil having been mixed with a lot of manure, the, the, the subsoil having been loosened and, you know, mixed with that, uh, uh, maybe we put some trash at the bottom there. The other one that we are not also promoting is the use of on-farm water reservoirs. This at the farm level, where you have a simple water catchment or a water pan that's about five meters by three meters by maybe two meters deep and that water pan can be done by the farmers themselves at their level it can it can you can even put a, a roof on, on it to minimize soil erosion and then that water is used using a conservative means of uh, rainwater uh, i mean of, of um of, of irrigation use such as drip irrigation or even in a greenhouse and that water is enough to run a good a crop for a whole season with high return, especially for high value crops with very good returns to the farm. And that's an example of uh, a crop of tomatoes growing in a greenhouse, supported by water from a, uh, 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 from a water pan. Some of the challenges, it's a bit tedious. You know, it requires a lot of energy, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of manual labor. Uh, there's no more lack of coordination of some of these issues of all in water harvesting for, 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 for farming at, 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 you know, at country levels. And there's also in, no, 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 I mean, no proper registration on the same. Uh, but according to available literature, irrigation plays a very important role in supplying food, and the potential can be huge if it's well exploited. Uh, in finishing, rainwater harvesting is a project technique that needs to be taken up because it has got a positive impact on agricultural production. It also helps to reduce runoff water and therefore reduce soil erosion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, very much uh, Lawrence. The next speaker is Dr. Alison Chatrian. Alison is the director of the Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions and a senior research associate in development, sociology, science. She facilitates interdisciplinary research and extension teams 
and helps develop resources and tools for climate change adaptation and mitigation. Dr. Allison has led the Cornell delegation to COP in Paris, to COP21. Her educational, sorry, her educational background is a PhD as well as an MA from the University of Maryland. Thank Over you so you. much. Um, so we're here today uh, to talk about our Cornell Climate Smart Farming Program, which is primarily a program for farmers in the Northeastern United States. We have another event tomorrow in the Africa Pavilion at 12 o'clock where some other research projects that we have in Africa will be presented. So Cornell, if you don't know us, we have a booth out in the front. We have incredible capacity on climate change with over 150 researchers working on this topic. Everything from climate modeling to Johannes is here working on biochar and soil health uh, to social sciences. And so I'm gonna talk today about an integrated social science project where we're really working on research extension and partnerships. And so just to give you a little bit of background on what we're experiencing in the Northeastern United States, definitely temperature increases with most of that occurring in the last 40 years. Uh, extreme precipitation, we have a 71% increase in very heavy rainfall events. We see a frost-free season length increase by 10 days. And this year we had, uh, for the first time in 20 years, a very extreme drought in the entire Northeastern United States. We also see changes in the plant hardiness zone and phenological responses where um, apples and grapes and lilacs are blooming much earlier than they were in the 1960s. So because of that, we've started this program called Climate Smart Farming. We see a lot of challenges for farmers and agriculture in the Northeastern United States including temperature increases, too much water all at once, followed by short-term drought, uh, pest disease and weed pressure. And then um, farmers talk to us a lot about the complication where it, there's a lot of uncertainty and variability year to year. Last year was very, very wet. This year was very, very dry. We also have a lot of opportunities though. Um, in, the, in the Northeastern United States, we will have adequate water. So we talk about uh, the need for mitigation in agriculture, which could include doing greenhouse gas accounting and assessments on the farm, energy efficiency, using more renewable energy. We also talk about agricultural adaptation. And what we've done in the United States in the Northeast is we've really identified what are the key agricultural products in our region that are produced? What are the key climate impacts that are affecting production? And then what, are the, what is the toolkit of adaptation practices that we can develop to help farmers? So we, with this, we have began this program that really mirrors Climate Smart Agriculture, uh, the program from the FAO, and it really has three goals. Increasing agricultural productivity, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and working on resiliency. I also wanna mention that in the United States, there's a healthy skepticism, unhealthy skepticism, I would say, about climate change, where only 73% of Americans believe climate is occurring, and 33% of those do not believe this is human caused. We see the same dynamics with farmers, unfortunately, where on average, we've done a study of all the social science studies in the United States. On average, only 65% of farmers believe the climate is changing, and only 31% of those understand that it's human caused. So we have a lot of work to do, both as researchers and with our extension system. We're also doing stakeholder-driven research, where we're really trying to talk to farmers, do surveys, focus groups, understand what their key risks are, and then develop tools and resources for them that they're really going to use. So we have this new website, you're welcome to go in um, check it out, it's climatesmartfarming.org. Unfortunately, right now, it's only for the Northeastern United States, um, but these are tools that could be expanded to other areas of the world um, in the future. So there's also a strong extension program that we have in New, York, in New York, and we have hundreds of agricultural specialists working in our extension system. 
Out of those hundreds, we've identified six specialists in, in New York. We have the first climate smart farming team in the United States. And these are specialists that are trained specifically on climate change and agriculture. We also have been developing resources with the USDA. And what farmers are telling us that they need most is really information about what's happening in their part of the world and what they can do about it. So we've developed three new tools and more are on the way. This is a new type of growing degree day calculator and you can enter any location in the Northeastern United States and it will tell you how much growing degree day accumulation there is for your location. It's already building in climate change because it's based on a 15 year um, average. And so that you can see here, this year's growing degree day accumulation was much higher than normal and much higher than the 15 year average. We also have two freeze risk tools, one for apples. Apples are a key crop in our region and a grape freeze risk tool. Because what we see is that with warming, longer growing seasons, uh, grapes and apples are blooming earlier. And unfortunately, what happens often in our country and other countries around the world is that they then get hit by a freeze. And so this is giving a freeze warning um, when the temperature is dipping below the hardiness. The final tool was very critically important this year because we did experience drought. It's a water deficit calculator. It's built, again, any location in the Northeast with, based on soil water capacity, cropping type, plant green up, and irrigation. Um, and so it's showing, this is showing the entire season that um, in July we were in severe water deficit stress. So this site also has a farmer forum where farmers can ask us questions as researchers. We can share information. And the resources that we have here, um, again, check out our booth out at 25D. Um, the Cornell Climate Change website, um, Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions. So thank you. I'll take questions at the end. Thank you, Alison. We would now like to take questions from the floor. We have about eight minutes. The speakers that have gone by before us, if you have any questions to them, you could address it to them, please. Yes, please. Over there, yeah. Yeah, maybe we can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tanya Ra, and I'm from CARE. Um, thank you for, for sharing your experiences um, and the work that you're doing, particularly in Ethiopia. I'm curious about um, the, the carbon... If you can talk about how those benefits are delivered to the communities and then how you also work with the communities to make sure that any kind of financial benefit is equitably distributed within the communities. Thanks. Yes, I think that was to you, Sophia. Thank you. Yeah, I, the, how it works, initially it was not easy, but uh, gradually how we did was uh, we organized the community into the legal cooperative. They organized into a cooperative. Uh, in particular, in this Humbo case, they organized into seven cooperative according to their closeness to that particular area. So the money coming from the carbon uh, finance is put to the cooperative, not to individual pocket, because according to uh, initial negotiation, uh, the process is agrees that the money has to be invested for the community development, community sustainable development, not for the individual pocket. If we split that small money in relatively, which is small to each and everyone, it is very small. But when you, you put that money into the community development according to their priority, that is making change. So how that is channeled? So far, how we are doing is that is a carbon buyer, the trustee is World Bank, and the World Bank is transferring the money to World Vision account. And the World Vision is transferring that money to the cooperative account, which the cooperatives are organized 
by World Vision. So the cooperatives sit together and invest that money according to the sustainable development plan on the ground. Maybe if you go there, you can see what has been invested by the community. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Any clarification required? Yes, please. Uh, question to you uh, again. I just want to understand what is this uh, nursery syndrome? I couldn't get it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a very good question, but important question to me. Yeah, meaning, um, as I in, in my first slide, as I showed you, the globally, the the global leadership, everyone they are thinking that we need a forest. But bringing back a forest is not easy. It needs a lot of resource. Particularly if you consider one seedling, one seedling cost in Ethiopia is now happening, production to planting, 0.5 dollar. But the survival is a challenge because of many reasons. Because the attention given to forestry is not like that of maize or wheat. So because of that reason, because of that reason, option has to be there one of the option in the forestry has been closing the area and just living forever but that is not useful because the trees are not growing and the communities are not benefiting so that that area which has been closed for some time may be burned out or lost across maybe five years or two three years later but you implement fmnr the, the community practice fmnr particularly the pruning thinning because of the pruning and the thinning, they can get uh, some biomass for the firewood and others. And in this in this case, you can definitely get forest coverage even before the plantation forestry. But the problem is that uh, what I said is the seedling uh, the nursery syndrome. Many foresters they want to establish forest from the nursery from the seedling, but going to the farmer money natural regeneration and bringing back the indigenous tree with small effort or small money from the community as well as from anyone or any public money people are not happy or they don't believe that fmnr can bring a forest but usually fmnr has been bringing a huge forest like if you go to niger in that desert or dry area more than five million hectare has been forest in less than 10 years and i can count in ethiopia and other countries in ghana ethiopia or some east africa countries so that is happening so this nursery syndrome the professional as well as the community people they think of that the forest can only be back when there is a nursery but we are saying that nursery is very costly yes we are not saying against nursery there are some fruit trees agroforestry trees which can pass through nursery but to bring the indigenous tree and some um, acceptable local tree species, FMNR is the best approach. Cost effective, scalable, and uh, uh, bringing a lot of biodiversity instead of bringing uh, uh, homogeneous tree species. That's what I mean. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, please. The last two. Go ahead, go ahead. No, please go ahead. In the meantime, we'll have it delivered. Right. Well, thank you. All right, so my name is Lina Abane. I'm from Cornell University. And thank you, everybody, for sharing your resources. I um, actually would like to have a little bit of feedback for the people who provide resources for the farmers in terms of toolkits. What do you think your rate of success, especially that we have three continents involved in the subject over here, and with what Alison have provided, that we have resilience for global climate change. I'm interested to see how often do you get contacted by people uh, to use these tools. I'm just going to compare it honestly with all of you, honestly, for my teaching. I think that's a question for you, Alison. It's a, it's a great question, Lena. Um, our extension specialists get contacted often um, because they're answering questions about extreme weather events. So last year, they were answering a lot of questions about um, the diseases that were caused by very, very wet conditions. And this year, there were a lot of questions about drought. Um, there were lots, very heavy losses in crop yields in the Northeast because of the drought. And so our extension actually set up 
a new system for uh, forage exchange because a lot of the livestock need, uh, the farmers need to purchase forage or food for their livestock. And so there wasn't enough forage and it's very expensive. So they set up an exchange system. So I think they are answering questions and they're now making the connection between these extreme weather events and climate change. Yes, next one. Hi, um, my name is Fran McRae and I'm with the International Cooperative Alliance. Um, these projects are really interesting and since we're talking about scaling up, I'm interested to hear your ideas and what you would envision for replicating these projects in other regions, in other countries, to get similar results that have been, for what has been successful so far. Thank you. Anybody you're addressing it particularly to? Yeah. All right, okay. Uh, could we then keep this question for the last question and answer session because it would bring together all what the others would say. Thank you. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Charles Nyandiga to UNDP. Charles is basically a forester with experience both in with practice and research as well as has experience with government development, bilateral organizations and United Nations. Currently is the technical specialist for the GF SGP, Sustainable Forest Management, and climate change adaptation. He's also the regional focus point for the Anglo and Lusophone Africa and Pacific regions of the UNDP. Over to you, Charles. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take you fairly very quickly in uh, one example of a community-driven project in Cape Verde. For those of you who know SGP, it's a small grants program implemented, implemented by UNDP, but it's a corporate program of the Global Environment Facility. So within that program, we're supporting a number of community-based projects across the world in 125 countries. And within it, we have uh, a specific programs which is looking at community-based adaptation. Now, in Africa, we have this program in a number of countries, but then I have decided to talk a little bit about Cape Verde. After me, a colleague of mine from Jamaica will say something small about what a practitioners actually do in the field and so we can relate that from what we say at the headquarters. Do advances. Okay, it looks like uh, you could do it by my hand. Look like I'm stuck on the first page, but. Okay, so within our programs, we have a number of um, what we are calling core programs of the small grants program. There's seven of them there, but this particular uh, case example relates to the second uh, program, programmatic area, which is the Climate Smart Innovative Agroecology. Next. Um, the project context uh, relates to Cape Verde. You can see uh, the description of the climate change impacts as assessed by the IPCC. We are seeing a situation where the temperatures are increasing, the rainfalls are becoming much less and fairly very erratic. And it is uh, a small island with uh, about 50% of its population very much dependent on agriculture. Um, just one minute. The particular community we are talking about, if you go back, is the Sao Lorero Ogai municipality, which is in Santiago Island. This particular island. Uh, has incidence of droughts, variable rainfall, per, which is actually becoming torrential, as I just indicated. But the rainfall itself is fairly very unreliable. And uh, the springs and the, water, and the water wells of communities are drying up. We are seeing increased soil erosion taking place on this particular site, uh, leading to quite a lot of uh, disturbances and poor you know, farming practices. Next. So the objective of this particular project was to allow the community's resilience, to, to strengthen the community's resilience to the impacts of climate change and climate variability. And in doing two things, one is awareness raising, and secondly, trying to build capacities um, around water and farming, um, and farming activities. So we have seen quite a number of things happen in this particular uh, community, and I'm going to take you through this. The thematic areas of focus for this particular project relates to water and food security. Next. 
Uh, the key actors that are involved in these particular projects are community members themselves, the NGO CBOs and the civil society. Government is playing an important role, in, particularly in taking up lessons from the field and bringing it up to scale. And also we have a number of key important groups that we have involved in. These are the youth, the elderly, the disabled and indigenous peoples. We find that it is very important and crucial that you get everybody along, particularly when you are talking about adaptation. And uh, for the sake of research and for bringing in new knowledge into the community context, the academia is involved. Next. Uh, so what are the measures? What are, is, what is what are actually taking place in this particular community? We have tried to address four key barriers, which you need to address if you are going to take your community out of poverty, if you're going to increase food security, and if you're going to make the communities better than what they are now. So you have to address issues that are related to institutional, technological, financial, and policy. These projects are tackled a bit of technological, financial for what we are giving, and we are seeing the results being taken up in the policy uh, arena. So in terms of maintenance of, um, in terms of technological support, we are talking about micro drip irrigation. And in terms of infrastructure improvements, um, there are a number of uh, structures that are coming up, like water storage facilities and water harvesting facilities. And we continue doing capacity building uh, for communities, which is actually taking place in our creation sessions. And down there, you can see figures, I mean, photographs of a few examples of what we do in this particular uh, project. So these are typically adaptation measures that are helping communities use their own indigenous knowledge, use their own traditional uh, practice and you know, farming practices, and infuse a bit of technology from outside and bring on board a bit of, uh, you know, capacity building support and bring communities to a level where they can actually feel comfortable facing the impacts of climate change. Next. Uh, we've seen quite a number of environmental results coming out of this. Uh, one is uh, floods and droughts can now be managed, and this is reducing the stress on agro agroforest ecosystems and on farmlands. We've seen that there's no much need for tracking water into the communities like what happened before. Increase water availability by having water structures built all over here and there. And the use of um, organically driven uh, manures helping to cover, to provide cover crops, helping to provide, to reduce, uh, you know, uh, water loss and uh, moisture retention. Uh, as a result of this, we have had uh, situations we have restored land, we have enabled water conservation and have decreased water stress on the community itself. Next. Uh, socioeconomic results and behavioral change. Um, in this particular community, we have had a situation, we have gone into that community to work with them to find what exactly is improving in their lives. Are incomes increasing? Are they getting better you know, yields from their crops? And we can say that you know, out of, the, of that particular community that I've described, uh, there has been about 700% increase in their livelihood in terms of um, sources of income, coming from the fact that they now have better water you know, facilities. They also have better yields coming out of their crops. And there's also be a very change, which is attitudinal change. And as you, as you might very well know that adaptation is not necessarily what you do out there, because then you don't see the difference between adaptation and normal development uh, work. So what we are talking about is how much are we changing people's attitudes, how much are we changing people's uh, behaviors, and how does that relate to way, the way they now manage their natural resources? Next. I'm going to run very quickly. Uh, in terms of uh, attitudinal change, I've said uh, perceptions have changed, and disasters are now not seen as disasters, they're seen as opportunities. Next. Uh, in terms of climate change uh, impacts, we have had a situation where water insecurity is now much more better than before, it's secured. Food insecurities has been reduced. We have had higher food yields and diversified food sources. Ecosystem degradation has been decreased and that floods, um, you know, the use of uh, water solar, uh, soil tolerant species have been brought on board. Next. And this has also impacted policy in a number of ways. One, these typical small little projects are impacting on the national adaptation plans. They have re been reorganized to be able to take lessons and impacts coming out of this kind of small projects. We've seen that uh, there's influence on the national plan for gender equity, particularly in Cape Verde, 
which are actually positive and can be attributed to this particular project. Next. Upscaling has happened, and uh, this is going on um, at the level of having bigger projects being you know, reformulated based on the results and uh, experiences of this particular project. Uh, we have had um, Cape Verde climate change uh, priorities being kind of reviewed and re-looked at in the context of successes of these particular projects. Next. And a number of lessons have, have, have been gotten from this project. One, we know that it's important to invest in the local people. That participatory approaches are actually very important, and this is actually not a new thing, but this needs to be reinforced in every other project that we do. We need to have technological inputs and training, uh, as well as uh, having farming systems at household levels, which may start small, but if it works, it will become big. This is the kind of motto that we're coming out of, uh, out of from this particular project. Now, just before I conclude, I want to ask my friend Latoya just to come in and say one or two, three things about a similar project we have in Jamaica, just to illustrate the fact that some of these projects that we see are not necessarily isolated. You find them in a number of places, and the results are almost the same. Just come. come. She had one minute. Tell her that. Yeah. One minute. One minute, please. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Add to Dr. Charles's presentation, we are also in Jamaica. I represent an NGO, and we in Jamaica are doing many of these projects. Now, we benefit from capacity building um, from some of our partners, which include the Jeff SGP. And um, one of the things that I'd, I'd want us to understand is that when we can work together, um, have government partnership, when we have the government on, um, on board, we can actually see more widespread results from these interventions because it is the partnership with the government that can inform policy and allow our work to, to be even more impactful. So I just want to um, highlight quickly one of the projects that we did. We had rehabilitated a community water catchment and constructed an earth pond and irrigation for irrigation. We also built the capacity of residents to sustainably manage water harvesting ponds and catchment. And we made this sustainably um, sustainable by being powered by renewable energy. And so we're trying to shift focus um, of our community members toward renewable energy, clean energy, as opposed to those that are unclean. So thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Marcella D'Souza. Uh, Marcella is the executive director of the Watershed Organization Trust, an NGO working in India and Africa. A physician by profession, she's an alumnus of the Government Medical College, Nagpur. So she has over three decades of working in rural area, areas, six of which were spent in the mountains of Peru. Her forte is natural resources management, organizing women for self-help and empowerment. And Marcella has pioneered the development of sev several community-centered tools relating to assessing vulnerabilities of communities to climate change across various sectors. Marcella. Friends, this evening I'd like to share with you the experiences we learned from doing participatory watershed development since uh, 1993 in a large scale in India. But after doing almost about 1,500 and more watersheds, Somewhere around to the year 2000, 2002, 3, we realized that there were a lot of good results coming from it. And at the same time, we found that there were a lot of other factors, particularly the changing in the, the weather patterns, the variability of the weather, increasing droughts that were causing severe problems, and we were not getting the results we had. And we were not getting the results we had. And then we realized that unless we in integrated the climate factors into the participatory approaches, we could not get the results we wanted. Next slide, please. So what we realized over there was that it is climate variability, but also non-climatic factors, that coming from market pulls, that coming from so many indiscriminate uses of the resources and also the development deficits that were leading communities to be vulnerable. And we needed to realize that 
if we did not address the climate variability, understand it, and make appropriate changes, we couldn't get the results we wanted. Next, please. So then, let me realize why vulnerability assessment. Today, if we are going to talk about the social development goals that need to be addressed, particularly goals 1, 2, 6, 12.2, 13, and 15, if these have to be addressed, the resilience of the communities need to be understood and appropriate interventions need to be made. We need to safeguard and insulate against the climate variability and target the particular areas that need intervention. We need to avoid the business as usual development patterns that often put communities at risk at a later stage, the maladaptive practices. We need to prevent wastage of funds because funds are becoming more scarce. We need to ensure sustainability. And because of this, next slide, please. We realized that we had to do vulnerability assessments and prepare projects according to that. That's when around the year 12, 13, we developed this tool, the Community-Driven Vulnerability Evaluation Program Designer, CodeDrive PD for short, it not only helps us to design the project, it also helps one to assess projects. It's a very good tool that later can be used as research. And it can be used on a small scale at a community level, at village level, at watershed level, even at a landscape level. It gives you a picture of a whole. It helps you to review the past and the present. To, it examines externalities in the influence and it helps, it gives us a five digit color code based on the five capitals approach. So you know exactly which area is affected, how vulnerable or how resilient a community is. We have applied this to the next slide, please. This is the software that is now available, which can help you to, in a very short time, pick up the vulnerabilities and get the codes and understand how to prepare a project design. We have tested this tool in a, recently in about 180 villages in four states of India. We are now applying it in government projects to be able to take this to scale through government programs. We have also initiated it in projects in Malawi. Currently, this is in progress. Next slide, please. A big area that we found, because we are talking about semi-arids, where agriculture happens to be the greatest income source of people. We realized that we had to address the issue of agriculture. And then we worked on methods together with farmers, being implemented in 156 villages with a lot of farmers, looking at the system for crop intensification. Going more organic, not exclusively, doing just what is needed, and helping the farmers Sorry, the previous slide, please. Yeah, creating a conducive environment for growth, enhancing productivity, reducing the cost of cultivation, and increasing the resilience to climate variability. Next slide, please. Besides this, the, the package of practices, as I told you in the previous slide, it's agrometrology that, is, that plays an important role. When these weather stations are placed in the villages, and with the help of the Indian Meteorological Department, it is they who give us the appropriate uh, forecast for the, uh, for the particular area. And together with the agriculture universities, we prepare crop weather advisories. And these are provided to the particular fa farmers of the particular villages for particular crops. So it is very localized that farmers can feel the benefit of doing these practices. So here what we are doing is, not just doing a project on our own, but bringing in all the other expert institutions, the MET department, the institutes that work in agriculture and that are mandated with it to partner together with us because together we can make a change. Next slide. The most important, a very important aspect in India is that there's a lot of water being exploited unnecessarily sometimes for productivity. 
And we found that if in the semi-arids we do not ex uh, work on good water use, we cannot give, get good changes, particularly in the long run. That's when we realized we had to go into participatory water budgeting. This is currently being done in 106 villages where we are testing out methodologies and, you know, uh, where villagers themselves make an assessment of the water availability in the ground as well as from the precipitation and plan out what types of crops they need to use and then go on the judicious use of water through micro-irrigation. And uh, besides this, what we are also doing is bringing the stakeholders together to come and discuss and understand how they need to put things into place. Next slide. And from all the experiences we've learned over the years, we realize that we have to do extensively uh, capacity building, which we do at the national, at all levels, and also internationally. So the projects that we have done have also gone to other countries uh, in Somaliland, in Tanzania, Kenya, in Malawi, in a big way, and extensively in India. Next slide. And this is how we do upscaling. Designing tools which can customize projects, engaging the various uh, stakeholders actively into the process, developing methodologies and testing these on the ground, implementing them, but together with action research and evidence-based research, which is required, and then upscaling it, getting them uh, into policy dialogues to take it to scale. So these are various partners that we work with because we realize unless we bring a lot of partners together, we cannot upscale it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcella. I would now like to invite Ambassador Thomas Meister. Uh, Thomas has completed his studies in economics at the University of Duisburg and has over 35 years of experience across a variety of diplomatic positions with the German Federal Foreign Office, working across several countries, of which from 2009 to 2012, you were the German ambassador to New Zealand and the several Pacific Island nations in Wellington. And after that, you were post posted in Reykjavik as the German ambassador to Iceland. He currently heads the Division for International Climate Policy in the German Federal Foreign Office. Ambassador Thomas. Thank you very much for this introduction. First of all, I'd like to say it's a pleasure for me being here with you, and I'd like to congratulate all the panelists for the, the excellent work that you've been doing in your fields, Cornell, um, the UNDP, um, Watershed, and the other organizations that have been working, also including Adelphi, for organizing uh, this, this workshop. Um, you might ask yourself, why is a diplomat joining this, this panel? And obviously, since we've heard and learned so much about the uh, groundwork, down-to-earth work, practical information that we received on the fascinating <coughs> work is a difficult for me to contextualize our work in this uh, area, but uh, there is some link. And if you look around the world, obviously, uh, what diplomats normally do is crisis management, especially in these days, you have crisis all over, be it in Syria, be it in Ukraine, and many other parts of the world. Um, and crisis management, obviously, is one issue, but we should not forget crisis prevention, and that's where our work comes in. Um, last night, I had a chance to, to watch the movie by Leonardo DiCaprio, which is called Before the Flood Comes. I don't know whether you already had a chance to see it. Uh, it's a bit of an eye-opener movie, I guess, maybe like Al Gore's movie 10 years ago or so. And for me, uh, one of the highlights of the movie was uh, his interview with Anoche Tong, the former uh, president of the Republic of Kiribati in the South Pacific. Uh, it's important to me because uh, you just mentioned uh, my time in New Zealand, and in New Zealand I was accredited to six Pacific Island countries as well, Cook Islands, Fiji, Kiribati, Samoa, Tonga, and Tuvalu. And out of those six countries, uh, especially two, which are Tuvalu and Kiribati, are the one among the most seriously affected countries by the rising sea levels. And in this interview, Anoche Tong really highlighted the problems of the, the tiny uh, country of, to, of, of, of Kiribati with the rising sea level, which is quite quite tragic. And he even mentioned that uh, people from Kiribati have already started uh, purchasing some uh, real estate, some parts of uh, Fiji Islands to move eventually, can you imagine? So it's uh, already that drastic. Now, I, I recommend this, this, this movie. 
And for us in the political area, uh, we sometimes look at the case of Syria, obviously it's a civil war with many routes of conflict, but uh, most of us, if not all of us, know that there's also another route, which obviously is climate. And uh, you might know that from 2007 to 2010, there was a, a long drought in Syria, which caused a loss of 75% uh, of the livestock and uh, the livelihood of uh, agrarians in that country, and which strongly contributed to the situation in Syria. We, we are always hesitating to say that climate change is the cause of the conflict, but climate change is always a risk multiplier, a threat multiplier. And, and that, on that basis, uh, Germany and other countries contribute to a more general approach uh, to the issue. And uh, in last year, during our G7 presidency, we introduced a study on climate fragility risks, um, which is called a new climate for peace. And we have Lina Lee from Adelphi with us. So she brought a few copies of us uh, to, uh, to the conference, which you might take along, but it's also available, I guess, in the internet. And it's a very recommendable study, I believe. And this initiative, as I said, was a German initiative among the G7 that is now carried on by the Japanese presidency in G7. And within this context of a climate risk analysis um, and following through, I might mention that Germany has taken has, has some pride in some initiatives that we are working upon, like our own uh, Internationale Klima Initiative, IKI, IKI, International Climate Initiative, which was started with the funds of the um, auctioning of our emission trading uh, system certificates and uh, so far i hear that we accumulated already uh, hundreds of projects three to four hundred projects so with a volume of uh, around three billion euros altogether accumulated which is, is a lot worldwide and uh, I'll just mention a few examples because we completely run out of time if we go through most of them but in, in uh, the, those uh, initiatives those projects are for example uh, one project uh, on climate change in Chile, India, South Africa, uh, which runs until 2018. We have a Climate Impacts Vulnerable Communities project in the Eastern Himalaya in India. Uh, we have an Indigenous Forest Reserve project in Papua New Guinea. Uh, there's financing for building community resil resilience uh, in climate change in coastal Vietnam. Micronesia challenge through new protected areas. Uh, forest landscapes in Kenya and Ethiopia is one of the projects that I might mention in this context and many, many more to go. So just this as a, a highlight of the, the work in climate resilience, which is really the catchword of the day and, and for the further context of, of our work, the foreign policy work. And I believe it will be our mission uh, to uh, raise awareness on the issue of climate resilience and climate uh, problems as a risk multiplier to the extent that one day in the security expert sphere, this uh, issue has the same um, importance like, for example, arms control, which is a, obviously a traditional um, security related issue. So if we raise it to the same level, then we've been successful. And on that note, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ambassador Thomas. We have now about 15 minutes for question and answers, and the, the session is now open to the floor. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Suleiman from Lagos, Nigeria. I thank you for your uh, presentations. I want to ask Dr. Charles, in your work with the farmers, um, part of the challenge I expect will be uh, that once in a while when we try to initiate uh, ideas like this to farmers, they have the challenge of trusting that their yield could actually improve if they were to uh, win off uh, synthetic fertilizer, for instance. So how do you assure them? How do you get over that inertia? Uh, secondly, do you have situations where you have to ask farmers to change from one crop to another? What kind of responses did you get? I'd like to know that. Thank you. Go ahead. Take this. Uh, thank you very much, Suleiman. I'm, 
I think it's a valid question, and it is one thing that uh, you will be confronted with when you're actually working with farmers out there. One important thing is that, um, you know, farmers speak the language of seeing results. They don't want just to be told things, and they cannot see those things translate into their lives. So one of the important things is that you should be able to talk to farmers, carry out uh, what we call a consultative vulnerability assessment with them, let them identify together with you what they think is most appropriate within their context and within their means. So I think the important thing is to carry them along. Uh, do not prescribe for them what to do. Once you do that and you go through one growing cycle and they are able to see the results, it's much more easier to convince them. So the convincing is by seeing, by hearing, and by being active players in terms of uh, getting the results. That's what we've done. In fact, within our projects, we have what we call a vulnerability assessment process, and that brings in a common unity among community members, helps you mobilize those communities, and help you actually design processes that they, they themselves own. And at the end of the day, they see that they are active players. So I think that's one way to do that. And uh, in terms of changing crops, um, it's actually not necessarily that you go in and tell them that I think this is the best crop for you. Now, it's the situations are changing, uh, the productivity of their lands are changing, and farmers themselves are actually very active researchers, and you will find that they themselves will come up with alternatives. What we do in SGP or in UNDP is to encourage what is tested and proven and is working and what is acceptable by the farmers themselves. So that is the premise that we build our projects on. And that's the reason I say it's a community-driven approach. We do not decide projects like I know many typical large projects do. They sit somewhere in a big capital city and then plan projects and take it to the farmers. We wait for farmers themselves to send us the ideas. We wait for farmers themselves to tell us how best they think they can do it. And we work with them to be able to develop the intervention. So it's much more easier when you, when you, when you conduct it that way. So I hope I have been able to explain. But in terms of quantifying the results, this is the next steps we are going into. And we have realized that a number of times, you know, everybody else wants to see things in figures, even when they are not necessarily very useful when you express them in figures. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Good afternoon. My name is Kai Kim. Um, I would like to pose my question um, to the lady from India. Um, I understand that the government of India has made some funds available for um, adaptation projects and I would like to understand from you how, how successful you've been using your tool in order to um, develop proposals for funding from the Indian government. Thank you. Well, there are a number of projects that the government of India has started off. And uh, what we are doing over there is, uh, as I shared over here, we are, we are testing, not testing, we are piloting this uh, use of the tool on vulnerability assessment in three states on, a government, on government projects so that they can help make these projects, uh, these watershed development projects more climate resilient. And we are now developing the whole methodology of what are the various types of interventions, uh, uh, what are the issues that they are facing related to the climate and other non-climatic um, vulnerabilities, and making modifications to the, uh, the whole um, watershed development uh, standardized uh, project to make them more climate resilient. So that is one aspect that is in process. The second one is that, um, the government has been giving, in each state, giving a lot of agro-met uh, advisories to farmers, and these were are more district-based. So it is broad-based for a district as a whole. With this method that we have started on giving locale specific agro-advisories, working together with the Indian Met Department and the agriculture universities to develop, um, to, to develop various uh, 
this uh, locale specific agromet advisories to come out with locale specific crop weather calendars. This is now being uh, worked on to take it to scale within the state so that farmers start getting more appropriate advisories based according to their particular crop and their particular region, not broad based. And uh, at the same time, we are also looking at, uh, like for instance, in the state where I work in, we are looking, uh, the government is looking at how to make water uh, use, be used more ju judiciously. You know, so it is uh, making the farmers more uh, use the water more carefully and planning accordingly. The whole issue is how do you get it down to scale? You can make a plan at the state level. How do you come down to make the farmers use it? And that is where we are actually testing out this whole water budgeting as well as stakeholder engagements in dialoguing with farmers of a group of villages together, bringing them in clusters together to understand the groundwater, groundwater availability, understanding the research, researching together with them, and then coming out with ways in which they can manage water more uh, at the village level as well as at a cluster of villages level. So these are some of the uh, methods that we are working on together with the government programs. Thank you. Any other questions? Two. The lady first and then the gentleman behind. Whoever is nearest, maybe you can start the question and then give it to her. It's Paul Marcella as well. I've got a follow-up. Um, you talk about scaling up using uh, through the government. What about using India's NGO network instead? Why, why, why does it have to be... I mean, obviously, scaling up is easier if you've got government's funds and uh, all the support they have, but why, why not use the NGO instead yes on the one hand we have been looking at the government because they are the major players but not exclusively you know while we have worked with government and with naba the national bank for rural and agriculture development to take these to scale with the ngos we have been working extensively in, in even earlier in hand holding and developing capacities so uh developing capacities of the NGOs through capacity building uh, uh, and trainings. And uh, therefore, we have, as I have said, we have done a lot of trainings across the country at the village level, at NGO level, at uh, government level, and various donors. Because we feel that the issue is very urgent. We don't have all the answers. A lot of other NGOs have the answers. We bring and facilitate this whole process also so that we can then upscale the good practices, uh, spreading it horizontally, vertically, and uh, both up and down. Yes. Maybe I can complement that. You talked about the tool code drive. That's available on the website of W, and it's freely distributed, supported by cloud-based software, which enables the user to actually aggregate and analyze the data it collects across various capitals, right down to the household level in terms of resilience or vulnerability assessment. So it's freely available. And it's also promoted and yeah, you got it. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. The lady next, please. Yes. So thank you all for your presentations. Uh, so we all know that agriculture is uh, very important and it's used. What do you think are the key challenges in agricultural financing? Because we try a lot to get a lot of money for Western Africa and the Indian government is different. Yes, the Indian government puts in money. Most of what all of you have spoken is not new. It has been there. We're regenerating it, adding new things to it. But agri most of the world has been a rural agrarian economy and it's changed. Why do you think this is complete lack of uh, the interest towards agriculture? Is it because it's not as sexy as other buzzwords in the development jargon? And can I just add one more further question? As you'll work on agriculture, what do you think are the sweet spots to interest the youth of today to be involved in this? Perhaps not in core agriculture, but process chains. Anybody in the panel? Yeah, please, Pablo. I would like to share one, what I think is a relatively new thing implemented by the Kenya Red Cross, uh, addressing the first half of your question. Uh, many times farmers are unable or unwilling to make um, higher than usual investments because of fear of uh, bad rains uh, spoiling their harvest, and so they don't engage in borrowing or in, in extra effort. Uh, Recently, there was a forecast of uh, El Nino, which meant, or La Nina, which meant uh, unusually high chances of good rains. 
And so uh, Kenya Red Cross distributed agricultural inputs that were more likely to give a bumper harvest among communities that were uh, chronically food insecure. And this uh, targeting based on time and space uh, with financing that is pre-assigned to take advantage of those opportunities that come every four to seven years to bring out of the below survival threshold is one of the things that I hope we can see more, the articulation of proven things that need scaling up. That's why I think there's all this fun, all right? It's proven things, but it's not happening big enough uh, along with new things. In terms of the youth, it is going to remain a very, very hard challenge. And, and uh, we see the extent to which the average age of the people who show up at the workshop keeps going on the edge of falling off the cliff of productivity. Um, and that's, that's very dangerous for food security. We have to figure out how to do it. One of the things that can help is to infuse this, um, the coolness of data processing and data collection and feeling part of something bigger. In Zambia, we have engaged youth in uh, monitoring river levels and playing a game where they submit via SMS their forecast of what the river level will be in 48 hours. So they're playing a game reading reality and sending values and whoever gets it closest to the actual observed value in 48 hours gets a fictional point and at the end of the season the one with the most fictional points converts those fictional points into real points that can be telephone credit or t-shirts or so on so how to tap into the cultural elements of what makes today's youth youth which is not the same as when their parents were young don't know the answer but needs to be thought very carefully thank you thank you very much any other questions Maybe I can add something to what he has said about the youth <clears throat> and just say that in the case of the youth, what mainly keeps them away from uh, agriculture are two, two main things. Number one, the issue of manual labor. They don't want anything as with manual labor. Number two, they want something that is, uh, gives returns very fast and they don't have to, to soil their hearts as they do so. So some of our experience in Kenya is that if you come up with certain well packaged technologies like, for example, greenhouse farming, which is a small unit, maybe half of this room, and you grow high value crops, and it does not require you to, 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 to really do a lot of manual work, and uh, you know, even if you into a, into a greenhouse unit or, or what you may call a, a, a tunnel, it looks a bit executive, it looks a bit interesting, more than taking a job and going to the farm. You are likely to change this youth. We have also tried with something that like we call hydroponics, where you grow fodder, you know, instead of growing on the farm, you just grow it on trees in the shelves. And again, this they talk about farming with stratos. And that way you are able to get them into, into the business of farming. So that's something that we can we need to think about more in terms of those kind of innovations. Thank you. Yeah, please. Please go ahead. Um, let me just let me also contribute to one aspect. I think that the question the lady asked is fairly, very loaded in, in a number of ways, I think. Um, one thing that I wanted to flag, which I think is also important to consider, is the fact that the food uh, habits and uh, the food consuming habits are changing all over the world. People are becoming aware of what they're eating. They want to eat things that are much more organic rather than inorganic you know, produced food. And so you realize that there is changes in perceptions and there's changes in terms of prioritization in terms of what people eat. So this is actually contributing to the fact that uh, the farming systems are not, not, not like they were before, where we were going for heavy, you know, volume kind of production systems. Uh, but people are becoming much more aware of what is coming out of the farms, how useful is that in their lives, and how healthy is that particular product. So I think that is becoming a key consideration in a number of things. And so you see farming moving away from large monocultures into much more smaller production units, which are much more environmentally friendly. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is that you might want to think uh, in terms of how youths want to be engaged in farming. They do not necessarily want to be in the primary production part of the farming systems. But when you go into the value addition sections, then you find youth are actually much more productive because then they turn away the, you know, the food crops into a much more valuable crop. So they're adding value on some of those food crops. And they seem to be playing an active role in that particular field, at least from our own little experiences working with the youth 
uh, in the field. So I think it's an area, it's an entry point for having the youth engage in the farming systems. I just wanted to flag those two key points. Thank you very much. We have now come officially to the end of the session. I would like to thank all of you for taking the time and the trouble to pre make yourself present here and participate in the discussions. All the presentations that you have seen here have been uploaded with the contact details of each of the panelists. If you wish to take it up further, please do contact them directly. And thank you for choosing to come here. Thank you. Thank you very much for Pablo, thank you. Yeah, no. you, 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 you should have taken her while she's speaking. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was much. a pleasure. Uh, I, I like what you talked about. Well, I'm sorry, I have to. That's okay, I totally understand. That's okay. I know. I'm used to it. It's okay. Yes. All right. So I'll just pretend that I'm speaking. We need this for a report. Okay. Good. Alison, thank you. Let's go carry. Yes. So, and one of the things that we did, yes. Let me let me pretend I'm reading. I'm Vietnam Ministry of Planning and Investment, my agent one, and Vietnam Ministry of Planning and Investment. I just want to look like I'm presenting. Um, Of investment, um, and, and investment because some of the things that we're talking about is that government needs to be a part of this. Maybe Dr. Charles should be did this his own. <laughs> Take one for me before with her and introducing her into the 